was mentioned earlier, this presentation really is a product of a multi-year effort for PIDS and so many partners. Just to mention our team members, we'd like to acknowledge, of course, our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, one of our research fellows, and our research associates and analysts, Oya Tagbon, Vivina Olaguerra, Anna Jennifer Umlas, Katrina May Zuluwaga, our regional partner from BSU, the Benguet State University, Doctors uh, Carlito Lorian, Sherry Lanio, Ruth Matani, and Alex Fagan, our partners from the LGU in Atok Benguet, particularly from the Municipal Agriculture Office, the Mao there and extension workers, Asia, the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research, for funding this initiative, and our partners from SARDI, Dr. Peter Heyman, Bronya Cooper, and from CSU, Charles Church University, Dr. Kevin Parton. Next slide, please. So farming in the Philippines is defined by uncertain seasons. So if you've been into the uh, nitty gritty of the sector, you've been into farming, or have you uh, studied um, agricultural productivity, both within technical and policy terms, you really uh, see that the landscape for agriculture is full of risks. Just a few days ago, we've been experiencing um, the havoc brought about by a tropical depression in uh, Ophel. And essentially, our agricultural stakeholders have been the recipient of so many uh, uncertainties in terms of their crop, current crop, uh, cropping. So looking at, for example, agrimet hazards and looking, looking at the possible uh, interventions that we can provide, really, this is a worthwhile undertaking, not only for PIDS, but also our partners uh, sub-regionally. Next slide, please. So the presentation is broken down as follows. We'll be presenting the, the project background, the characteristic of our um, case study site, which is Benguet. Third one would be identifying climate sensitive decisions. Fourth one is assessing barriers to access and utilization of weather and climate information. Fifth one is our effort to co-develop and co-learn with our local stakeholders. And the sixth is the mapping of social networks in African communities. So this is uh, an aggregate of so many studies done for several years under this uh, very broad undertaking. So the project is premised behind the gap between the source of weather and climate information, which for the Philippines is PAGASA as the mandated institution, and the end users composed of farmers, extension workers, traders or middlemen, and our local partners, including LGUs. So the gap between the two has to be addressed. Questions are, how is weather and climate information disseminated? What are the barriers and opportunities to access and use of weather and climate information? How do we improve decision-making on and off farm? And what is the value of weather and climate information for uh, agricultural stakeholders. Next slide, please. Again, just to reiterate, we have so many partners without whom uh, the outputs of this project wouldn't be possible. So we have Asia as the funding agency, we have SARDI, we have CSU, we have PAGASA, we have DA, we have UPLB, and our regional academic partners, BSU, MINSCAT, as well as the LGUs in Mindoro, as well as in Kiev. So for PIDS, we've done work to identify climate sensitive decisions. We've done work to value the use of weather and climate information. We've also explored decisions uh, on farm and off farm, uh, including the processes by which farmers and stakeholders come up with such decisions. And we did co-learning and co-development activities with local partners, just so to develop the decision-making tools that we'll be presenting later. Next slide, please. 
focus wise uh, we have several project sites for pids it's benguet focusing on upland uh, rainfed communities planting high value crops for you for uplb it's uh, them looking at the traditional staples rice and corn in the door um, before our midterm review for this project we also covered Lepe, but uh, we dropped that uh, eventually and focus on just two sites so stakeholder wise we initially looked at farmers the lgus and members of the value chain and now we have shifted on looking at, at the change agents particularly the, the extension workers within our forward localities in terms of our investigative approach so we've been studying climate sensitive decisions related to such commodities i mentioned earlier and related to the use of um, weather and climate information as well. So how did we do that? We went forward, engaged with local partners and tried to learn with them and develop with them the tools for decision analysis. Next slide, please. So this presentation really focuses on our Benguet study site. So Benguet, as most of you know, really is our uh, major source of vegetables for, for the country. It's the fourth biggest province in CAR, but more than half of its municipalities are poor, belonging to the fourth and fifth classes. Most of the almost half a million population of Benguet depend on agriculture, providing around 80% of the country's vegetable needs. They grow the crops based on a type one climate, meaning there is a defined wet and dry season uh, for the year. And because of that, they also encounter so many hydromet related hazards, including typhoons, frost, which is, I think, quite unique to that area, hail, which is also a bit unique, drought, heavy rainfall, flood, erosion, and landslide. Next slide, please. In terms of farming issues, upland wise, we have a lot. So, as mentioned in so many uh, literature, upland rain wet farmers are among the poorest. Now, aside from actually earning so little from their farming activities, they face so many issues, including penurial concerns and environmental concerns as well. Their farming activity requires huge inputs for them to be actually productive. And probably compared to the lowlands, they have more labor requirements. For example, if you're going to look at input application, um, labor requirement per se is quite huge for high value commodities. But if you, you are within the highlands, particularly in, in the Benguet area, the labor requirement is quite huge. It's multiplied probably by uh, so many folks. Climate and weather induced disasters leading to crop damages and supply chain disruptions. That's very particular for the car area when they transport vegetables on harvest and there are extreme uh, seasonal climate uh, anomalies, then most likely you'll have a very uh, limited inflow of produce coming from that area to the major uh, consumption areas in Metro Manila and uh, the nearby centers. Erosion and unsustainable cropping systems, very particular for uh, sloping and upland communities. And then they have constrained access to support. So you're going to look at, for example, government support to agricultural stakeholders within remote communities. Uh, it's much less compared to what you have in communities with uh, irrigated rice. Uh, as the main crop being produced. Next slide, please. So Benguet, in terms of rainfall, we're looking at uh, a multi-decade presentation here, a histogram, you'll see that well, Benguet receives not noticeably less precipitation during its dry season. However, the province has an extraordinary amount of precipitation during the rainy season with the months of July and August being the wettest. Um, 
I think later on you'll see that uh, in July as well as October are the months with the most typhoon occurrences. Next slide, please. So Benguet's temperature is usually about 10 degrees lower compared to the lowlands. From 81 to 2010, climatological normals show mean temperatures ranging from 18.1 degrees in January to 20.8 degrees in April. So malamig pa rin. Uh, lowest temperature recorded, although not negative, was 6.3 degrees. Uh, way back in January 1961, the highest was recorded 30.4 degrees in March 1988, during the 1988 Next slide, please. So for seven decades, a total of 39 tropical cyclones crossed Benguet. 20 reached typhoon category, 10 tropical storms, and seven were tropical depressions. July and October had the most number of tropical cyclones within seven and eight, respectively. So this month, October, really is a critical month for agricultural producers in Benguet, as well as those um, into trading local products. Next slide, please. So just to profile our stakeholders, we did a survey uh, among the households of agricultural producers in select communities in Denguet. And these are the, the highlights of that, that survey. Next slide, please. So most of the households reported that they are not beneficiaries of any social protection group. So this, is, I think, is a very big concern for not only for the, the local uh, farmers and agricultural stakeholders, but also for the government and those providing support to the communities. 80% of households experienced disaster in the past two years when we did the survey. The typhoons experienced by 74% of households and identified as the most severe weather shock. But 73% of the households were able to completely recover. So that's a good thing. Uh, that is a testament to the resiliency of uh, the farming communities within the province. Radio is still the major source of weather information among households. TV ranks second, while mobile phones rank third in terms of sources of information. So these media, uh, well, the most common weather and climate information delivered are tropical cyclone warnings. And tropical cyclone warnings, particularly uh, reports on typhoon occurrences, really are the most appreciated among the local stakeholders. Next slide, please. So the community was found to use weather and climate information and farm management decisions. That's a positive. Uh, in terms of weather and climate information, tropical cyclone warnings were deemed as the most important uh, information from Pagasa. Rainfall forecasts were also important, but uh, was seen as somewhat reliable. The community also used forecasts on temperature, uh, which is important given then gets uh, colder climate. The rain-fed nature of the agriculture system is also evident. Rainfall is one of the foremost considerations in decisions such as planting, harvesting, and irrigation. So essentially, um, operational tactical decisions for farming operations. Climate information as well as farm management decisions and securing credit are often dedicated to men. So that's also a gender-related input uh, that we got from the household survey. So men and women have their roles in terms of decision-making on farm, off farm, and within households. And looking at that interaction, that dynamic between uh, the genders really is a big thing in terms of us delivering support and information. Next slide, please. Okay, as you can see here, most of the households reported that they are not beneficiaries of any social protection programs. Um, I think most of them were recipients of field health insurance. That is, I think, a big plus given the pandemic right now. 
but it's still not 100% coverage of ill health. So there is room for improvement. And for the rest of those indicated in this slide, I think it's worth uh, going the extra mile for the bureaucratic actors that we have within government and the outside uh, to cover as much of the, of the population in terms of social protection. So a lot of them actually were not members of uh, any social protection programs. Next slide, please. In terms of shocks, um, a lot of them experienced those in October, followed by August, iPhone wise. So this month, as I've mentioned, really is, is a critical month for agricultural producers. And a good testament to that is the tropical depression we've experienced during the past couple of days. So I think even now, a lot of our localities are experiencing uh, intense rains, intense precipitation, leading to flooding, as well as uh, agrometry related landslides. Next slide, please. So radio is still the major source of weather and climate information among households. Um, this probably is the easiest in terms of us augmenting that preferred source. TV ranks second, although we don't have ABS-CBN now, uh, it's still uh, a major source of information, not only for weather and climate uh, services and products, but also for other information related to uh, the critical areas of their daily living. Mobile phones uh, rank third, and probably right now, accessing the internet is also a major um, avenue where in there they get uh, the right information, the needed information for their farming activities, as well as for daily decisions household-wise. Next slide, please. So males usually receive the weather information. And this probably is different in other areas, but for Benguet and the communities that we have interviewed, males um, perform such a role and probably a lot more in terms of decision-making on farm. So gender dominance probably has to be studied more and as augmenting, for example, the contribution of uh, the opposite gender, the opposite sex to the scheme of things really would help a lot in terms of our uh, progression initiatives. Next slide, please. Okay, tropical cyclone warnings is the most common type of information received by farmers, as they have mentioned. This probably has the, the most practical impact in terms of their on-farm activities and decision-making. So it's rated as the most useful and most reliable as well. Blood warnings mostly seen as not useful that's for the upland areas in, in Benguet. And rainfall forecasts rated as somewhat reliable, given that there are so many microclimates uh, in such uh, a varied terrain as what you can see in, in the car region. Rainfall and temperature forecasts are perceived to be somewhat adequate as well. Next slide, please. So identifying climate sensitive decisions the use of climate information. So aside from the actual uh, survey that we did for select uh, communities in Benguet, we also did so many interviews, informant interviews, so many exchanges with local groups through focus group discussions. Next slide, please. And we have gathered so many inputs in terms of um, the use of climate and weather information on operational, tactical, and uh, strategic decisions related to farming. So in terms of operational decisions, rainfall is the most important consideration in farming operations. See here storage decisions, harvesting decisions, crop protection, irrigation decisions, schedule and level of pesticide application, schedule and level of fertilizer application. So basic day-to-day -day activities on farm are affected by the information that they receive, weather and climate wise. In this case, rainfall advisory really is the most important. Slide, please. 
Percentages are presented in this slide. 76% reported that rainfall affects their decision to apply fertilizer. 78% affects their decision to apply pesticides. 75% um, reported that rainfall influences their irrigation decisions. 66% uh, reported that rainfall affects their crop protection measures. 72% affects their harvesting decisions. Storage um, did not influence that much, uh, or was not influenced by, by uh, climate and weather information that much, as, uh, as we have received from our uh, key informants. Next slide, please. In terms of tactical decisions, we have the allocation of land for the next season, the allocation of financial resources as well, decisions to look for off-farm labor, planting schedule for the next season, crop variety choice for the next season, crop choice also for the next season. So in this case, advisories on ENSO, La Nina and El Nino influence the planting schedule, the crop variety, um, and the crop choice for the next season. So this is a season-wide uh, advisory that uh, farmers and other agricultural stakeholders prefer to consider when deciding on major decisions, major tactical decisions. Next slide, please. Again, uh, you have here uh, the details in terms of percentages for tactical decisions. Next slide, please. In terms of strategic decisions or the long-term tropical uh, cyclone currents or well, the long-term uh, considerations in terms of changes in climate within the region or within the, the communities that they have, um, you see here the critical decision on the crop livestock mix to follow, decision to uh, to go for perennial crops compared to annual crops and the actual land use for their for their farms. So these are well decisions with long-term implications and probably uh, more investment uh, on the part of the the farming household. Next slide please. More on climate sensitive decisions in terms of crop choice. Um, forecast wise, uh, when you have drought or below normal rainfall, as advised, uh, the response usually is drought tolerant crop uh, adaptation, such as the planting of potatoes and radish for, for a few of our farmers in Benguet. So this goes the same for so many activities that are affected by the information or forecast that they receive, climate and weather wise. So you have here crop choice, planting time, source of irrigation, occurrence of specific uh, agreement uh, phenomenon, such as frost, for example, activities, including harvesting. So these are some of the on-farm activities that are affected by the type of um, climate and weather information that they receive, including forecasts. So there are so many responses available to farmers and really going through them and trying to assess whether they are applicable and whether they are the optimal solutions to such um, is, I think, a very good exercise, not only for farmers, but also for those change agents looking at augmenting or helping farmers in terms of their productivity options. Next slide, please. So decision makers, LGUs, institutions, trackers, uh, those within the value chain, they are, a lot of them are looking at the ENSO forecasts, the occurrences of El Nino and La Nina, which have season-wide implications. So it's either for them uh, to provide more public investment in terms of uh, providing services, or uh, putting more money in infrastructure and delivering uh, whatever the needs of the local farming communities are. So you have here, for example, the samples of uh, responses like the distribution of uh, irrigation uh, infrastructure or equipment, uh, 
the delivery of uh, required water. Uh, in some areas in, in Benguet, they had to transport water really in, in, uh, in those areas not accessible by, by hoses or any other means of irrigation, supplemental irrigation. Um, they could look at sending more advisories through SMS and, and through other means. So for those within the supply chain, there are so many options, including delaying transport, looking at other centers, uh, for selling the produce. Next slide, please. Barriers to access and utilization of weather and climate information. Next slide, please. So we did a couple of um, workshops. One led by Pagasa for a national consultation, and the other was led by PIDS and UPLB for the regional consultations. For PIDS, we did our consultations with Benguet as well, looking at high value crop producers. And uh, we were helped, we were assisted by the Benguet State University, our local partner, in terms of ground activities under the project. We were also assisted by our partners within the localities, particularly those uh, within the ATOC LGU. Next slide, please. So in discussing, for example, the products that Pagasa has, uh, weather and climate uh, forecast wise, it's worth doing a technical domain analysis. Uh, for example, if you're going to look at the array of products and services that we have right now, there are so many, and a lot of them really uh, would be difficult for, for farmers and some of the stakeholders to grasp in terms of the technical uh, breadth and dimensions. So we tried to categorize the products into four. Uh, you have your weather warnings, weather forecasts, climate outlooks and advisories, and climate projections. So weather warnings provide updates on adverse weather conditions such as heavy rainfall, tropical cyclones, storm surges, and gales. So these are um, very immediate in terms of uh, their effect. Weather forecasts at most uh, include forecasts three days forward. So you have a, uh, some sort of a lead time for, for these uh, forecasts. Climate outlooks and advisories are forecasts with weekly, with weekly to six month uh, coverage. So a season long coverage at the most. Climate projection, nationwide projections for climate for mid and late 21st century. So these are long-term projections, uh, looking at possible changes within the region climate-wise. Next slide, please. Okay, so you have here uh, some of the barriers indicated by our stakeholders in terms of mismatch of understanding and users are more attuned to forecasts with more tangible impacts. So typhoons, rainfalls, and not much, not much in terms of looking at long-term forecasts, including climate change. So how can they uh, make decisions based on currently intangible uh, matters, including changes, for example, of the level of precipitation, including changes in terms of the actual seasons that they have, so a few forecasts translated into dialects. So we need to laymanize so many of our products for, for local consumption and understanding. Forecasts focused on a wider area, not reflecting microclimates. Again, I think in terms of the literature, it's been mentioned so many times that we have to look at uh, localized uh, forecasts, you know, provision, provision of weather and climate information for certain uh, microclimates for certain areas. Training on climate change adaptation for government extension workers, services does not reflect local realities. Again, grounding applicability, whatever we're conveying to our stakeholders. In terms of infrastructure barriers, we have Pagasa products and services that are primarily online. So if you don't have connectivity uh, infrastructure within the area, it'd be difficult for you to actually access and take hold of those products that 
we have power outages uh, within the province, limited ownership and use of uh, gadgets, including smartphones and and computers. Cost of improving infrastructure in car is also very high. That limits the development of whatever connectivity investment that they that they require within within the locality. Slide please. In terms of resource barriers, forecasts may have clear implications, but some of our stakeholders are unable to carry them out because of financial infeasibility. Adaptation of strategies with clear benefits over multiple cropping seasons often require very high initial capital expen expenditure. Farmers deterred by registration paperwork for loans and financing for, for formal establishments or institutions leading to informal credit relationships with disposers that uh, lessens their revenues and bargaining power. So there is also a need for more information in terms of specific phenomenon like uh, what we have in Benguet, frost, and as mentioned earlier, localized forecasts and probably the possibility of having real-time weather and climate uh, information delivery. Next slide, please. The opportunities to leverage weather and climate information. We can invest in the local provision and transmission of information. Uh, weather and climate data reflecting more focused area. We can tap local DRR related infrastructure, including in institutional infrastructure, fund connectivity initiatives, and we can look at up the better upkeep of automatic weather stations and the better use of data coming from those automatic weather stations. An asset to localize, laymanize, adopt impact-based reporting, impact simulation, more convenient low-cost loans uh, that shift away from unhealthy credit exposures, real-time provision of weather and climate information as well. Next slide, please. Okay, in terms of developing decisions, uh, discussion tools, as mentioned earlier, we did uh, co-learning, co-development activities with local stakeholders. That meant us going to the area so many times and us really interfacing with them, trying to come up with applicable tools for decision making. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. So among the tools that we have uh, come up with is the crop climate calendar. This is um, an upgrade of the traditional crop calendar that we have. It's um, a visual decision discussion tool that presents crop phenology, cultivation practices, and weather and climate concerns in each locality. So it's very simple in terms of uh, an aid for decision making, but really coming up with the actual crop climate calendar was a bit tedious uh, in terms of us uh, interfacing with not only with um, local stakeholders, but also experts, uh, technical experts uh, on the field. Next slide, please. We looked at uh, verbal decision as as well, in terms of um, putting more structure into a decision-making framework. Next slide, please. And then the Rapid Climate Decision Analysis, or RCDA, which is an Excel-based platform that inputs um, the growing costs and projected income for climate state using probabilistic forecasts. Next slide, please. Okay, just an example of your conventional crop calendar, presenting the commodities and when they are planted during the year. Next slide, please. Now you have the the crop climate calendar, which is, I think, a very big upgrade in terms of the contents that we have included. So you have the um, the physical uh, inputs required in terms of uh, the growth stages of the crop, farming activities, the risks involved, in, including pests and diseases, weather and climate risks. Next slide, please. And uh, everything is indicated within uh, 
uh, the appropriate timeline for the cropping season, either it be for the wet or dry season in Benguet. Next slide, please. So for this initiative, we actually developed three uh, crop climate calendars, one for cabbage, one for carrot, one for potato. So we iterated so many uh, interfaces with local stakeholders, growers of these commodities, and we tried to get as much input from experts for the scientific side of uh, things. So interfaces were not only with farmers, but also with uh, key members in the communities, including local government officials. Next slide, please. So examples of what you have as well in our climate calendars, common practices in terms of land preparation, irrigation, fertilizer application. So we see a lot of uh, cultural practices that transcend commodities you know, in the area. But there are common activities even if you are planting different commodities in the uplands, I think. Next slide, please. So I'll just go through very quickly. These are the contents of uh, our crop climate calendars, and really it's worth looking at them individually. So pest and disease management, you have here uh, details for cabbage, for carrot, and for potato. Next slide, please. Okay, you have your carrots and then potato. Next slide, please. Weather and climate risks. So you have so many indicated here. Hail, rain, heat, rainfall, excessive uh, radiation, frost, temperature, water deficit. Next slide, please. So it's the same for the other crops carrot, cabbage, next slide please, and potato. Next slide please. So with the crop climate calendar, you look at the, the preferred crop uh, in the area and um, try to aggregate all the requirements in terms of the, the growing stages, in terms of the required inputs, within a cropping season uh, and also taking into good consideration all the risks involved, pest and disease wise, as well as uh, weather and climate related uh, hazards. Next slide, please. Yeah. For rapid climate decision analysis, uh, RCDA, farm productivity is dependent on weather and seasonal climate states. RCDA links farm budgets and seasonal climate probabilities in a decision context, and our very own Dr. Peter Heyman from Sardi uh, initi initiated this uh, platform. So this, I think, is a very good uh, visual for uh, aiding the decision making among uh, not only farmers, but also among extension workers in terms of the options that they would uh, convey to their constituents. So, for example, you have here a good table. And just coming up with this kind of table really is very tedious. You have to have so much uh, interface time with local stakeholders. What's good here is that, um, well, you are getting everything quite quickly. So it doesn't uh, rely, for example, on having season long trials for you to get actual numbers in terms of uh, input and uh, productivity figures. But really, you just interfacing with stakeholders and probably experts uh, in the field uh, would do for a very quick uh, um, platform for discussion. Next slide, please. Okay, so you have here the yield and gross margin estimates for cabbage, carrot, and potatoes during the wet season for a one hectare rainfall farm. In this case, cabbage yield the most uh, and resulted to very high uh, cost margin estimates. Next slide, please. Okay, RCDA as well. Next slide, please. 
So this is the uh, this is how RC day looks like. Uh, you have number one, the probabilistic forecast chart uh, up there. Number two, uh, the profit decile graph. Number three, the graph of difference in cost margins. And number four, the comparison of long-term average cost margins. For example, if you're comparing uh, cabbage to, to carrot, uh, or trying to make a decision whether to plant carrot or cabbage for the season, this is, a, I think, a very good uh, visualization tool for you to look at eventual uh, productivity outcomes given uh, weather and climate uh, information for that season. Next slide, please. Okay, another uh, part of the RCD interface. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, well, uh, no, no, uh, let's go back to that slide. So you have here, for example, uh, two cases. To your left is an RCDA um, run showing you um, a case where there is no forecast. Okay, so up there you have the, the even uh, 33, 33, 33 uh, probability for um, seasonal scenarios. The one to your right is uh, a case wherein you have um, a wet forecast for the season. So you see movements in terms of uh, um, the cross margin movements based on the deciles. Eh? And uh, the graph below shows you the differences in terms of cross margin. So really, I think in terms of uh, it being a tool for decision making, it's a very good way to start uh, discussions with farmers as well as extension workers in terms of making eventual decisions. Next slide, please. So we've done the same exercise for several critical decisions on farm. And that included, for example, uh, the choice of crop, um, the planting dates, as well as the investment for potential irrigation uh, augmentation on farm. Slide, please. So each of those runs really necessitate a deeper uh, discussion. So um, what we are saying is that there are possibilities given a certain season and given the probable weather and climate state during that season. And you looking at basis for comparison in terms of eventual performance really would help a lot. Slide, please. Okay, still uh, the RCDA showing you uh, the range of its uh, potential application. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so in looking at RCDA, we look at uh, the potential state for a certain uh, cropping season. And then you base your decision making in terms of potential performances of your, uh, your choices yeah, or alternatives uh, in terms of, for example, um, operational and tactical uh, options for that certain uh, commodity within that certain season and given a certain state. So it's a very quick way to value decision outcomes given different seasonal climate states using farm budgets per crop, per season, per seasonal climate state. It allows outcome iterations given probabilistic forecasts for a given season, particularly for critical on-farm decisions such as planting schedule, crop choice, facility investment, etc. The caveat is this is just a discussion tool. It's not prescriptive. So whatever um, the figures in terms of potential outcomes that we have 
generated using RCDA, it's really not us telling them that you should do this or you should plant this or you should extend your planting schedule to this day. So it's really just a tool for them to uh, to decide and for them to discuss possibilities. Next slide, please. So that's RCDA. Now we go to social network analysis. Next slide, please. So in trying to better understand as well the communities we were working with, um, we did um, social network analysis. So it essentially characterized information networks. It identified and described both central and peripheral nodes and assessed the extent of reach of extension workers. So we grounded the study in Benguet, in three CTOs uh, within APOC. And um, the next slide will show you the, uh, the networks that we have come up with. Next slide, please. So we need a full enumeration of households in CTO proper Pauai, CTO Tulodan, CTO Macbas. These are uh, CTOs with different uh, situations. For example, proper Pauai is close to the center of Atok. Tulodan and CTO Macbas are a bit more remote. So they have different uh, access to information as well as facilities for sourcing information. Slide, please. Okay, so bounded network of inter-household social relations. You have here networks in Pauai, Tulodan, and Macbas. Network density matches with expectations based on CTO characteristics. Proper Pauai, larger and closer to the municipal center, is less cohesive compared to the more isolated communities. Next slide, please. It's probably intuitive because if you're looking at uh, the more urban communities, neighbors don't really talk to each other. Networks vary by type of weather and climate information, showing greater activity for more tangible information, such as rainfall and typhoons. So you have here the different uh, weather and climate products and the different networks, social networks associated with their transmission. So heavy rainfall warning, tropical cyclone warning, daily weather forecasts, El Nino, narratives, and non pagasa sources. Next slide, please. So networks by type as well, uh, weather and climate uh, information in Tulodan. Next slide, please. And then in Macbas. Next slide, please. This one presents the extent of penetration of our agricultural extension workers based on social networks. So the red represents nodes who have interacted with extension workers. This shows the penetration of uh, the areas in terms of the reach of our change agents. Next slide, please. Extent of penetration of AEWs in Tulodan. Next slide, please. And this one is the case in Macbas. Next slide, please. Okay, last two slides, key insights. Gaps exist between the provision of weather and climate information and its use in the agricultural sector, presenting barriers to operational, tactical, and strategic decisions on and off farm. Number two, weather and climate information must be communicated through effective channels while continuously improving the area of agromet products and services that we have. Number three, capacitate extension work uh, agents and strengthen information dissemination and stakeholder support mechanisms through connectivity and institutional augmentations. Number three and uh, number four, consider localized forecasts, dialect translations, and impact-based reporting. Number five, pursue funding and support for mobile information access, digital platform, and the upkeep and better use of the automated weather stations for possible localized and real-time delivery. Slide, please. Engage progressive farmers and community leaders to promote weather and climate application and better understanding 
on how they are transmitted within communities. LGUs and NGAs invest on and initiate action to effectively communicate productivity options and weather and climate information, including the range and importance of available products. Of products. Enhance hard and soft infrastructure, physical networks and institutions, including real-time advisory services for on and off-farm operations, and invest more in R&D to develop decision-making tools for change agents and smallholder farmers to improve outputs and navigate complex risks in farming. And lastly, consider climate change adaptation, disaster preparedness, and resiliency as anchors to better on and off farm productivity. I think that's the last slide. Thank you. <laughs>